Hello and welcome to our online service. My name is Emma and along with my husband Joel, we're the lead pastors here at Hope City KL and thrilled that you're joining us today. And uh, maybe we've got some families joining us today as well as part of their celebrations for Mother's Day. If you're a mum out there, I hope you got breakfast in bed for all our mother figures, our grandmas, our aunties, those women in our lives that play that mother role to us. We appreciate you, we're thankful for you and uh, believing that today you would know the gratitude of your family that is around you. Thank you for all that you do. And uh, we are standing and praying with you in this season. I know motherhood can be difficult at times. It's a challenge, but we are glad that uh, you are here and able to celebrate with us today. Uh, we are going to start our service like we always do with some worship. And uh, this is our honor. This is our privilege. So let's not sit back, just relax, check out social media in this moment. Let's partake in this time as we set this aside to bless and to enthrone God as our Savior and our Lord. He's done incredible things even this week in your life. His protection, His guardianship, His love and His care over your life has been at work. And so let's take this time to thank God. So stand with us if you can, sing along. The lyrics will be on the screen and let's praise God now along with our team from church. Oh 
unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies to all my fears are gone I no longer a slave to fear for I am a child of God I no longer a slave From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I know. Cha
child of God. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. Father God, we just thank you uh, for the opportunities that we have this day and age to worship you together. We thank you for this online service. And uh, Father, we just open up our hearts and our ears to you and your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us today, challenge us through today's message. Father, we are asking, Lord God, that you would draw so close to your people today. Speak to us uh, in the way that we need to hear specifically, God. I pray that you would um, bring courage and hope into the lives of every person that's watching today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. You can type an amen down in the chat. Um, a huge welcome to you if you're part of this service and you missed us at the start. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mums, uh, those that are celebrating that today. Uh, we are having a great time over this month and going to have a great time. It's only week two, um, but we're excited about this series that we're looking at the heart. Pastor Joel's gonna be speaking in a little while as we unpack these topics like anger, jealousy, guilt, all these types of things that as humans, we just have to battle and face on the daily in some cases and to some extremes and even in the small ways. And so we're really believing for some health and wholeness to come to us as a church as we dig through this series over the month. Hope you've been enjoying it so far. You can catch part one, which was an introduction last week on our YouTube channel. Whenever you would like, go ahead to the Preach playlist and you'll find it right there at the top of the list. Uh, well, I would just like to encourage us right now, if I can, in our giving. And there's some details that are gonna come up on the screen for you to be able to bring an offering to God. And uh, we do this every week. It's an important thing for us. It really helps us uh, just to prioritize and position ourselves correctly when it comes to wealth and to finance. And we encourage every person who calls Hope City their home um, to tithe, to bring into the house of God, to bring their 10% of their income, of their increase, however that looks for you, whether you are salaried or a freelancer, um, or you have other streams of income, whatever that looks like for you. You know, by bringing that first portion, the rest of it becomes blessed. And I wanna really encourage us, you know, God can make our money go way further than we could ever go. He brings miracles, opportunity, favor to our lives that we could never bring about by ourselves. And so I wanna encourage you in your giving today. We're not asking you to go um, above what you've got and get yourself into debt and do crazy stuff, but we are asking you to posture your heart really well and bring something generous to the house of God that He might do a miracle with it in your life and also in the lives that we seek to reach as a church. So go ahead and use those details on the screen. If you're part of Vision Builders and you're redeeming part of your pledge, then make sure that you reference your giving with a VB for Vision Builders. Uh, if you're bringing tithes and offerings in today, then you can go ahead and do that as well. In a couple of weeks, we'll be letting you know a total as well for our Vision Builders offering, which we're really excited about. And so uh, we're just so expectant over the next six months as we seek to raise 175,000 ringgit about what God can do through his people's hand as we generously extend it to others. And so be a part of that miracle story. Whatever your season is looking like financially, you can partake in this moment. We encourage you to go ahead and do that. Well, while you're giving, why don't you continue to check out the screens? Uh, we've got a story for you to enjoy before we head into this week's message with Pastor Joel. Hi, my name is Sasha and I've been in Hope City for three years now. Back in 2016, I started my degree in law and it was going great until the ringgit crashed and caused a few issues with my finances. So I ended up taking a gap year. Long story short, due to lack of finances, I had to drop out. During that time, I felt really stressed out and I didn't know what to do. Felt like my plan was crumbling in front of my eyes. So in a rush to restart my education, I was pushed to do a degree in IT. Thankfully, I got a scholarship but I started it with zero interest and I just told myself that it's okay, I just need a degree. The degree made me extremely unhappy. I felt like I couldn't focus in classes. I just really, really wanted to drop out 
and start working. But I felt like I couldn't disappoint my family that way. Everyone around me kept telling me that, you know, without a degree, you couldn't go far. And it scared me enough that I kept going. In October that year, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wanted to drop out. So I stopped listening to what other people were telling me and I decided to turn to God. Ultimately, I kept coming to the conclusion that I should drop out. I was so unsure because I felt like the scholarship he gave me was such a huge blessing. And I felt like there is no way that he wanted me to let go of that. I kept praying and finally in February last year, I couldn't resist the urge anymore and I decided to take a step out in faith and just trust in him. I had no corporate work experience, I had no car, but I decided that I was just going to trust in him and that no matter what, he would take care of me. Thankfully, through God's grace, I managed to secure a job as a PA for a unit manager at a big insurance company. Six months later, I became an insurance advisor at one of the biggest agencies in Malaysia. A month after that, without me even searching for it, I got offered a job with a higher income and a company card to use. In December 2020, I achieved my Supremacy Award. It's an award for the high achievers in the insurance industry. I couldn't believe it. Everything was happening so fast. Just when I thought that, you know, he did it again, he would just bless me with even more. I felt like everything was falling into place. Even though I faced several difficulties, I felt like the blessings just kept coming. So I just want to encourage you today that just as it says in the Bible, in Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your path straight. If you feel like God is leading you to take a step out in faith that may seem scary or daunting, I want to encourage you to just trust in Him. Sometimes we think we know what God is thinking, but just like how I thought that God couldn't possibly want me to let go of such a huge blessing, when in reality, He was just waiting to give me something better. So I want to encourage everyone here today to think of whatever blessings you think you're holding on to, to just let go and let God. Well, hey guys, and welcome to church today. So great to have you here. If we've never met, my name is Joel, and along with my wife, we're the lead pastors of Hope City in Kuala Lumpur. And it's awesome to have you here today because we are in the second part of our series all about heart health. If you have a healthy heart, your whole life is healthy. But if you have a dysfunctional, broken, bitter heart, everything flows from that. We're going to be talking in this series about how to get your heart clean, pure, healthy, and free. And I'm sure this is going to be a great blessing to you. Let me start off just by talking for a moment about debt. Have you ever been in debt? You ever had huge financial problems and maybe yourself, you've been in debt, or maybe you know someone else who has been in debt. And when we're in debt, it can have serious emotional effects. Me and Emma, right early on in our marriage, we weren't in huge amounts of debt, but we felt the effects of not having a lot of finance. And every single month, that weight would crush us. It would be awful working out how we're going to pay the bills and how we're going to get money into the right places. Well, debt is a worldwide issue that almost every single person can relate to. And it's a worldwide thing that even includes Malaysia. Right here in Malaysia, seven out of 10 millennials, this is from Bank Nagara, don't live within their means every month. And the average Malaysian carries over 10,250 ringgits worth of debt. Three out of five Malaysians who have credit cards can't afford to pay them off every single month. And 300,000 Malaysians file for bankruptcy every year. The majority of cases are to do with car loans that they can't afford to pay. It's awful being in debt and the emotional effects of having a debt that you cannot pay are horrific. From anxiety to resentment because of the debt, to denial of the debt, to stress because of the debt, to regret of having debt, to shame of debt, embarrassment of debt, and obviously fear of will I ever be able to pay this back. Now, Why am I talking to you about debt today? It's because the first issue of our heart, which is called guilt, well, guilt feels like debt. If you're guilty, if you've ever had that sensation of feeling guilty, really what you're saying is you owe something to someone that you can't afford to pay. And guilt can be a weight that we carry around in our hearts that can affect our whole life. Think of um, 
If I right now walked into whatever room you're watching online church in or your vehicle or however you're interacting with church today and I stole the device that you're watching on, what is it today? I hope it's not expensive. could be a brand new iPhone. Maybe it's a, a laptop, a television. I don't know what it is you're watching online church. But if I came into your situation and stole that equipment from you and ran off for my life, well, I'd be in debt to you. And I wouldn't only owe the equipment that I stole, but I'd feel in debt for the trauma and the pain that I caused you from that experience or from the time that you've no longer had that device. I'd be indebted to you. That's what guilt is all about. I owe you something and you're expecting something from me. And it's through everything in life. Think about the father who walks away from his family, the husband who leaves his wife. He's in debt to his wife for the years that he's broken. He's in debt to his children for the time that he's taken away that they've lost their dad. He's in debt to all of that. He doesn't think about that at the time, but eventually it catches up and guilt comes into his heart. Oh no, I've taken something away that I can't easily repay. I owe something and someone's expecting something of me. And here's the thing, when that guilt gets lodged in your heart, it can weigh down your whole life. We said last week that the heart's the, not the physical beating heart, but the other heart, the emotional, spiritual aspect of who we are, the center from which all life flows, Proverbs says, that heart there can be so affected by guilt. And if it really is the place where everything flows from, it means that the guilt that's in our heart gets lodged there and it affects everything. Hey, the way you turn up to work is affected by the guilt in your heart. The, the intimacy you have in your marriage is affected by guilt in your heart. Your friendships, even your interaction with God can be affected by the guilt that you carry in your heart. And if we want to have a healthy heart, if we want to have a free life, a healthy life, we have to know how to free our hearts from the guilt that builds up year after year. And so I'm going to give you the solution right now to guilt. This is the first week, the first issue of the heart. We're talking about guilt. Read this with me. 1 John 1 verse 9 If we confess, if you're at home, I want you to write that word down in your book. If you're watching this with other people, say out loud the word confess. If we confess our sin, listen to this, this is beautiful. He, God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful promise from God, that God can can remove guilt from our heart. If we confess, we can be free. If If we confess and we truly mean it in our heart, God, take this guilt away. Our hearts that have been weighed down and crushed by guilt, we can be free. We can be pure. We can be cleansed and our whole life is impacted by a result of that one decision. What an amazing God we have. You know, the God who is over your life today is a God who loves you and believes in you, who so wanted you to be free from guilt that he went to a cross and poured out his whole life for you so that you could be free. He took the punishment on himself. Anything that we owed was put on him and he took it and he made it possible for forgiveness to flow and grace to flow so that you and I could be free from guilt. What a beautiful thing. But you know, when I first read this scripture, I was a young boy in Sunday school and we were doing memory verses. And I remember at the time reading this and thinking, you know what, this sounds too good to be true. Because if I mess up, if I sin, if I do something wrong and then I confess to God, well, then I can just go back and repeat the whole cycle all over again. I mean, this was like, this is a loophole. I figured out a loophole to Christianity. I don't have to change. I don't have to be transformed. I can just do whatever I want and then confess. And then the guilt's wiped away. (laughs) And every single night I'd finish off the day. I remember being taught by my parents at the end of the day, you pray to God and you apologize for the stuff that you've done wrong. So I'd sit there and one by one, I'd list off all the sins that I did wrong in the day. And I'd try and list it all as accurate as I could. And even if I missed anything at the end, it would just be like, and sorry for everything else that I've forgotten about. And that would it. 
That would be it. The sin bucket in my heart would be empty and I would be clean and I would be free. But then here's what happened. I began to notice a bit of a dangerous pattern. Because if you live that way, if God is just on tap to be confessed to and to forgive and there's no other implications, I started to preempt sin. And when I was tempted of sin, I just remind myself, hey, it doesn't matter. All I have to do is confess. God keeps his part of the bargain and we're all good. Here's what's happening is that my confession habit wasn't freeing me from sin. My confession habit was supporting my sin. Confession is there saying, go for your life, do whatever you're doing, keep on sinning. I wasn't confessing as a method of trying to change myself or get to that place of being a righteous person. I was confessing to simply have some guilt relief. Maybe you got your own version of this too. I'm sure we all do at some times, abuse that beautiful grace of God and simply confess. And really in our hearts, we have no real desire to change. But all we wanna do is just have a quick moment of a cleansed conscience. Look, there's two main problems with looking at confession this way. It's a simplistic way, it's a wrong way, it's a broken way, and it's not biblical. There's two problems. Firstly, if you view it like this, your heart doesn't really get free. Your heart's never really free. Because we just pop a confession, like we take a Panadol for a headache. We try and get rid of the quick effects of guilt in our heart. Ah, I feel guilty, quick confess, that should do the trick but it never really goes deep enough to heal the wounds that guilt has put on our heart, which is why we end up then going back and repeating the same cycles of sin over and over and over again. Because we never confess to change, we just confess to try and remove symptoms of guilt. The second problem is this, it must be insulting to God. Think about it this way, imagine you had a family member who kept talking bad behind your back insulting you, stealing stuff from you, taking money from you. Once a week, your family member comes up to you and says, hey, I'm really sorry. And you know that he's gonna say that, you forgive him, you send him on his way, but just as he gets five steps away, he turns around and he repeats the same thing over and over. Week after week, he comes to you and apologizes and goes out and does exactly the same thing. How'd you feel about that family member? What would that do in your heart to your relationship? What kind of impact would that have on you? Maybe you'd be feeling that person's using or abusing the grace that you're extending to them. Would you even keep a relationship with them? By the way, we've got to remember that God is eternally patient, beautifully patient, unconditional in his love towards us. And he gives us chance after chance. He does keep on waiting. And even though we abuse his grace, he is still waiting for us to change. But Put that to a side for a second. How must it feel to have a relationship with a creation who uses your grace like that? If our pop culture way of confession is wrong and it's unbiblical, then what does true confession look like? Here's the difference. You know the secular definition, the world's definition of confession is simply to acknowledge that we've done something wrong. That's how most of us treat it. That's as deep as it goes. But in the Bible, confession is so much deeper than that. The Bible, confession is always associated with life change. It's actually just one step in a sequence of getting away from guilt, leading the guilty out of darkness into light. It's one step of a whole process called repentance. Confession's right at the beginning. It says, I'm going to repent. I don't know if you ever heard the illustration about repentance, but you see the person walking in one direction towards their sin, but then repentance says, no, I recognize the way that I'm going is wrong, and I turn 180 degrees away from my sin, and I walk in the other direction. That's what repentance is. I'm turning my life around, and I'm going in a different way. And in biblical terms, whenever confession comes up, it's always assumed and always associated with life change. Check this out, Numbers 5, chapter 5. We're gonna go to the Old Testament and see how God's people, the Jews, thought about confession. Numbers 5, verses 6 to 7. Say to the Israelites that any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty. There it is. And he must confess the sins he's committed. And they, make, they must make 
full restitution for the wrong that they have done wrong, and they should add a fifth of a value to it and give it all to the person that they have wronged. Check this out, confession here is nothing about making yourself feel better or getting a clean conscience or wiping the slate clean. No, confession is hard work. Confession is saying, I recognize what I did was so deeply wrong. The sin has had consequences. And now I'm gonna be responsible. I'm gonna take ownership of my life, of my action, and I'm gonna repay whatever I can to make things right. Imagine taking a fifth of the value on top of it and then giving it to the person. That's, that's not just words saying, I'm sorry, God. That's not private confession. No, this is a very public moment of saying, I'm turning my life around. There's another great example in Luke chapter 19. Take this, Zacchaeus the tax collector. I don't know if you ever heard of Zacchaeus' story before. If you're in Sunday school, you would have heard of him as the cute little guy who crawled up the tree. Well, he wasn't really, he was a cruel man who had a very negative impact on a lot of people. He was a tax collector who used to abuse his power to take more than he should have. And one day Jesus eats with this very hated evil man. And as he's talking, Jesus' love breaks through into Zacchaeus' heart and he realizes what he's done wrong. He's cut to the heart and convicted of the wrong and the mistakes that he's made. And so it says in the Bible, in Luke chapter 19, verse eight, Zacchaeus, he stood up. And he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Can you see that? This is the evidence of confession. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Notice that instead of the, what we read just now, instead of one fifth of value, Zacchaeus gave back four times the amount. This is over and above. This is him recognizing, I've got to do something about the consequences of my actions. This wasn't confession to make himself feel better about himself or to cleanse his conscience. No, this was life change. And notice too that it wasn't just enough for Zacchaeus to confess his sins privately. That was a first step, but it was only the first step. He gets up and he actually makes a difference in the people that he's wronged. And Jesus says to him in the last verse, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Jesus is essentially saying, now I can see for sure that salvation's come. I can see, watch this, this is, this is how it works. I can see evidence. I can see evidence in your heart, in your life that you've changed. And he confessed in the truest sense of confession. So over and over when the Bible speaks about confession, it's not just a quick private prayer to God to relieve us of guilt. No, no, this is a turning of your life. And if possible, to make it public. And the people who you've wronged or the people who you've impacted to somehow try and make a difference, to repay them, to show the grace of God, to pour back all the grace that you've received. And could it be, I'm asking the question today, could it be that guilt, gets lodged in our heart for so long, for years after year, and we can't get rid of it. Could it be that we're treating confession wrongly? Could it be that we're treating confession to get rid of the guilty feeling like some kind of mental conscience relief, but it never goes down into the deep places of our heart? But today, I want us to make a decision. No, we're going to confess our guilt. We're going to repent of our sin, and we're going to turn. And if you will do that, Freedom will come to your heart. You can be fully free. Guilt won't lodge there any longer because you are, you are having confession and repentance in the truest sense of the word. I'm inviting you today to leave that life of sin behind and turn from your ways and say, God, free me from this stuff that has caught my heart and caught my attention. I'm deciding to leave sin behind. I'm deciding to confess. The secrets in my heart, I'm deciding I'm not going to carry them any longer. I'm going to be humble enough to lay them down and to confess and to get it out into the open so that I can live free. Here's a couple of thoughts for you just as we close. True confession is public, not just private. It's public. It has to go public. Jesus talks again about reconciliation in Matthew 5, 23. He says about people going to church, he says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and you remember that your brother is something against you, 
then leave your gift there before the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother and then, then come and offer your gift. We say, well, of course, we should care about strained relationships and broken relationships, but, but really, couldn't this wait till after church? Jesus is like, no, 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 before, before you come to me, before you come and worship me, I want you to go and get right with people, reconcile with people. Jesus reverses things. Why is the reason he's saying this? Is because our ability to worship God sincerely is hinged on our relationship with other people, including those people who we've offended. We can't say that we're resolving our differences with God whilst not resolving our differences with people who we've offended. We can't be in fellowship with God and everything's great between me and God, but out of fellowship with other people because of the way that we've lived. The two go hand in hand. Jesus is trying to connect them. He's saying, hey, your relationship with people, it affects this relationship with God. And that's why private confession before God, although that's true, that's needed, that's helpful, it's not the full picture. Simply saying you did something wrong to God, it kind of lets you off the hook. But true confession goes public. True confession goes to people who you've hurt and they go hand in hand. Why does God go to this length of saying this? It's because God values relationships. He values people. He values your relationships. He values you being a blessing in your world. It requires connection with other people. And that's why confession is so important. Today, you might have to do something. It's going to cause you to humble yourself and be a little bit bold, but do it for the sake of your own heart. Do it today. Make that call that you've been dreading making. Set up that meeting that you know is gonna be awkward. Write that letter that's gonna be pretty hard to write, but do something, humble yourself, own up to your part of the problem, do something and come back to God. And then when you worship him, feel the freedom that you have before God, that you've done everything in your power to be at peace with people and to make it right. Here's a second thought, true confession breaks the grip of sinful behavior. It breaks the grip. If you've had patterns of guilt and sin and addictive behavior in your life, true confession can break that power in Jesus' name. You know, the grip of sin lies with secrecy. The longer things are secret, the longer things have a grip on you. But when you expose them to the light, when you swallow your pride, guilt can lose its grip on your heart. And the power, watch this, the power of the cross was to defeat sin. But sin can lose its grip on us when we agree with God and we confess against ourselves that we've done wrong and we receive the healing from Jesus. It's not just enough to receive the power of the cross. We've got to actually confess that in our own life and take that internally. Thirdly is this, true confession is connected to healing. This blows my mind. James 5 verse 16, watch this scripture. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up if he's sinned and he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sin to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Notice there that confession is connected to healing. And what's strange is that James seems to indicate here that sickness is somehow connected to hidden sin. And wherever you land on that, I guess the one thing that you don't want to miss is that hidden sin, if, if nothing else, hidden sin is the cause of sickness in our hearts. Hidden sin, secrets, holding on to stuff that should be confessed and declared and freed of. Confession, not only to God here, but confession to each other, James says. So according to James, this is a public thing. Again, it happens to each other. Hey, friend, can I just tell you something that I'm dealing with in my heart? Here it is power is broken the moment that you do that you expose it and we pray for each other and we say hey me too i'm struggling with that too let me pray for you and together the power of sin gets broken as we bring it into community fourthly is this confession true confession it breaks the cycle of sin because here's how it works if we keep everything private we can go on being repeat offenders without any embarrassment of course, we come before God and we have to say again and again, but the moment that you confess something openly and publicly, the chances are you'll have less chance of going back and repeating it because it's breaking the cycle of sin. You've made something public. If you confess to your sales manager that you inflated your numbers last season, <laughs> last quarter, 
if you keep your job, you're, you're probably not gonna do that again because it's embarrassing to talk about. If you have the courage to tell a friend, hey, that thing that you told me, actually, I told someone else and I'm sorry you said it in confidence, you're likely never to do that again. If you own up to your teacher and say, hey, I'm sorry, I cheated on that exam. I bet you that will be the last time you do it again because when you make something public, true confession, it breaks the cycle. It says, hey, I'm, I'm putting this out there. Keep me accountable. I'm not gonna go down this way of living anymore. And so I'm gonna invite you to do one thing today. You know what it is. Something in your world to bring it into the light through confession. And there's guilt in your heart. There's guilt in all of our hearts. Trust me, believe me, I'm not perfect. None of us are. Every single one of us have stuff today that's weighed us down, stuff that we've said, things that we've done, stuff that no one knows about, things that we just, we're carrying. We owe something to somebody else and we'll never be able to repay it. But once we've confessed before God, the next thing we've got to do to free our hearts from guilt is confess to each other. There's got to be a moment here of going public. And look, I know you might say, this is so hard, it's so embarrassing. What if someone rejects me? What if someone pushes me away. Well, there's a chance of that happening, but don't forget who's in the wrong here. You do it, you come open, you come clean. I bet the chances are that you'll find healing and stronger relationships and things being restored. Intimacy can be restored back to your marriage again. Friendships can come closer. Churches can have a greater sense of unity when godly confession is the thing that we live by. Listen, if you're feeling embarrassed, if you're feeling uh, insecure about bringing this into the open. Remember this, your level of desperation for freedom has to be higher than your level of embarrassment. You can live back here in darkness and in shame, carrying the weight of guilt, or you can decide to step into the light and say, today I'm gonna get humble, I'm gonna be open, and I'm gonna talk about what's going on in my heart. Not only am I gonna receive forgiveness from God, remember, if we confess, He's just and able to forgive us and cleanse us and all unrighteousness can be gone, but also I'm gonna get right with people, with my neighbor, with the person that I've wronged. You know, King David, just great example before I pray for you. He's a great example in the Bible of someone who was wrecked with sin, adultery, murderer, he's a liar. All that stuff you think, well, surely that writes him off. No, he walked with intimacy with God because of his authenticity before God, his integrity to say, I'm struggling with something. And he had this fellowship with God. You too can have that today. No matter what you've done wrong, you can have intimacy with God and intimacy with other people, but you're gonna need to bring it out into the open. You're gonna need to confess and say, God, help me today to get my heart cleansed from all guilt so that I can be free. So let me pray for you as we do that. God, I pray you give us courage today. Courage today to every person watching to say no, enough is enough. We leave behind a life of sin. And we confess, not just privately before you, not as a way of abusing your grace, but we confess with our whole heart. We turn from our wicked ways and we say, God, would you have your way? We remove the splinters of guilt in our heart. And we say, make us clean, wash us white as snow. And as we speak and have those conversations this week, I pray for every person watching that healing and reconciliation and courage and freedom would come back to your people. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Fantastic. Well, a huge thank you to each one of you for being part of today's service. And I don't know how you feel about it. Maybe you're like, I just don't know anything. I don't know what to do next. Well, one of our team would love to get alongside you, help you out in this season, uh, give you a Bible, give you some resources to help you get the basics, pray with you, help to answer questions, introduce you to the opportunity of Alpha. We've got all sorts set up, especially for you to help you out in your journey with God. So please get in touch. Let one of our online hosts know through the chat down below, or you can DM us go over to our website hopecity.my forward slash hello and there's an option there for you to request some help assistance prayer contact whatever you would like uh, go ahead and go to that page right there using the details on the screen right now for everybody else we hope you have an amazing day for your families celebrating your mums uh, give some phone calls if your mum is not in KL today you're not able to meet up um, go and extend some appreciation to those mother figures in your world. And for all those mums who in this season are praying and believing for the day when they can hold their own family in their arms, we stand with you today in faith and in hope uh, that the God of
of miracles would come and do a mighty work in your family and that he would give you opportunity to extend that heart of motherhood to people around your world and one day to a child of your own. We stand with you in a prayer for that miracle too. We love you church. We are so thankful for you and really pray that God is doing a mighty work through you as we just look at this topic of the heart. Uh, ask God, even this week, reflect over today's message and ask God to do a work in yourself, to give you the strength to make some changes and to confront those things of our heart that need some attention. Uh, there's a brand new day that awaits us uh, as we go through this topic and this thing. Make sure you catch up on YouTube if you've missed any episodes so far. Have the best week and we'll see you next Sunday. We love you. God bless. Thank you.